Um, the aim of this paper is to examine staff weapons in the context of the fight book genre in the 15th and early 16th centuries. In contrast to the longsword, which dominates the majority of relevant sources from this period, staff weapons are more manageable to study as a whole. Isolating and approaching this microcosm within the body of sources might allow us to extract some useful information about the weapon group in the context of fight books, as well as highlight some of the problems in their research. The study of staff weapons in the 15th and 16th centuries in Western Europe as a weapon group presents a great anomaly compared to other weapon groups, uh, again, such as, as the sword. Modern research on arms and armor, or even studies on broader, on broader warfare, or even studies on broader warfare of the period, completely ignore and omit the use and importance of staff weapons, or often reduce them to a minimum. This could actually be interpreted as the echoes of certain historical masters. Um, indeed, in the martial arts of Renaissance and in the martial arts of Renaissance Europe, Anglo noted that the Dripper's treatment of staff weapons in his 1553 uh, Trato is so perfunctory that it's thought to be interpreted that he rather despised them especially given how it is compared to the two-handed sword, which he was also unfond of. It is not an exaggeration to state that generally staff weapons are mostly overlooked academically, both contextually as well as, as, a, res as, well as a resource material. Often, generic studies on warfare for this period refer to them as peasant weapons. However, this idea has been disputed and discarded by historians who studied the changes in the martial traditions of this era, and acknowledge staff weapons as the tools of the trade of the professional soldier of the time. Perhaps the dismissal of this weapon group is directly connected to the importance and longer tradition of the sword, both as a weapon as well as a symbol of both status and power. The most convincing explanation to the lack of mention of staff weapons can be tracked to the study of primary sources where they are also often underrepresented. Uh, underrepresented. Written sources, such as the Chronicles of 15th and early 16th century, rarely mention them, and detailed mentions come only from order rolls and receipts of the period, which are usually quite hard to track in local archives. The exception to this is their artistic representation, which, in the course of two centuries, features a staggering amount of staff weapons in a variety of thematic cycles, from religious and war scenes to portraits and representations of civic life. Fight books appear to follow the same trend as other, genres, as other literary genres of this period when it comes to staff weapons. However, the more contained nature of the genre allows a better observation of the subject. A quick observation of the primary source and modern corpus of specialised research also reveals that staff weapons are overlooked and largely outshined by the longsword. Besides the academic part of historical European martial arts studies, this appears to have a cause-causality effect with aspects of modern HEMA practices, where staff weapons are also often used as a secondary or tertiary practice subject. Um, so what do we mean when we discuss a staff weapon? Um, I'm sorry for the large body of text, um, but we need to be specific when discussing what exactly a staff weapon is. Um, so a staff weapon is a two-handed weapon used on foot which, depending on its type, can have different offensive uses, such as thrusting, cutting, pulling, throwing, and bludgeoning. It can be edged or blunt. It mainly consists of two parts, a long wooden shaft surrounded by a metal head. Additional parts are sometimes added on the shaft as part of a finishing process, such as reinforced metal strips called langettes. On occasion, the shaft is made of steel or other metals, and the heads can sometimes include wooden parts. The length of the shaft varies depending on the category of the staff weapon, and can be from one up to six meters. Additional parts might be attached to the weapon, such as a spike on the lower end of the shaft, protective hand guards, or mechanisms to safely secure the head onto the shaft. The utility of staff weapons revolves around the reach that they can provide to the user, as well as the different offensive potential based on the technical characteristics of the weapon's head. Their versatility depends on these characteristics and can potentially allow the user to perform a succession of hits with the consecutive use of different features, or complex actions such as disarming, tripping, tangling, and pushing. The aim of the wielder is to increase his threat at range and by an increased power deriving from the kinetic energy produced through perpendicular thrusts and centrifugal strikes. Staff weapons can be devastating against both infantry and cavalry as most were designed to penetrate armor. Their length allowed the user to fight enemies on foot from distance and to be able to withstand a cavalry charge or even cut down a mounted opponent.
At the same time, the increased length was also their weakness, as they could not be used effectively in close quarters combat. Um, it's worth mentioning at this point that although spears and pikes belonged in this category, um, and have, dun -dun -dun, uh, they have been taken into account in the quantitative, quantitative analysis of this paper. Uh, they are, however, mostly excluded to give space to the more popular and complex weapons that define this part of the genre. Um, this leads us on to another quick definition we just need to make. Um, we also need to define the term axe. Um, so uh, axes and axe and variants of the word uh, refer to wider refer to a wider group recently categorized by Yarson as axe hammers, but can also be categorized as pole axes. Modern scholarship um, has also produced an inconsistent terminology, which we've decided to ignore. Um, as it, just, it just muddies the waters further, and you have things like uh, pole hammers and these really anachronistic terms, um, which confuse things. Um, weapons of this group are composed of two or three different features, taken from a, big, bit for, taken from a bigger list, which includes an axe blade, a long hammerhead, an angled or curved horizontal spike called a beak, a coronal-shaped hammer, which is like a hammer which ends in three or four prongs, as we have here, um, and a vertical spike of various sizes. Um, so this is just a very brief overview um, of the appearance of staff weapons in fight books for the period we've looked at. Um, however, it's important to note that this is by no means a complete list. Um, for example, in our treatment of work by Fiore de Liberi, We've just looked at the Fior de Battaglia and the, uh, not taking into account um, his other manuals. Um, and the same can be examined in the works of Hans Talhofer, where, like Eric and Daniel, we've mostly focused on his 1459 um, fight book and ignored sort of some of the earlier, the earlier, um, the earlier sources. Um, in other places, in the interest of keeping this paper within the 20-minute slot, um, we've omitted other sources which detail the use of staff weapons completely, such as the Clooney fight book. Um, nonetheless, the presentation of the material here um, gives a basic overview of how staff weapons are treated in the 15th and the first half of the 16th century. But for all the numerous typologies of staff weapons which exist um, and which are listed here in fight books, um, it's only really the axe hammer or the pole axe which you see being treated with any regularity in the 15th century. Um, the most detailed fight book which broaches the use of staff weapons is Le Jeu de la Ache, a 15th century text produced in the Burgundian court detailing the use of the ash or pole axe. Um, several theories have been proposed as to a more precise dating for this anonymous manuscript. Um, the earliest of these is by Sidney Anglo, um, who dated it to the first quarter of the 15th century. Uh, Ken Monshine recently argued that it was likely produced by Ambrose, a Milanese master hired by Duke Philip the Good in 1434. Um, even more recently, um, an analysis of the language, vocabulary, and other factors by Olivier Dupuis and Vincent Deleuze suggests a dating between 1460 and 1485. Um, the problematic dating of Le Jeu de la Ache in modern research is in direct correspondence with the problematic dating of staff weapons in the 15th century. Um, based on its contents, it could be dated from anywhere from the first to the last quarter of the 15th century. However, it is much more likely that the dating proposed by Dupuis and Deleuze is more reasonable uh, due to its alignment with an increasing use and appearance of axe and staff weapons in general contemporary sources. Um, why is the axe the most common staff weapon in 15th century fight books? Um, again, arguably this is due to its representation, uh, sorry, its reputation as the most chivalric of staff weapons. It was, for example, a consistently popular choice in the numerous pad arms of the 15th century. Uh, thus, for audiences with an interest in ownership of an ennobling martial art, as argued by Forgang, um, it made commercial sense for fight books, uh, commercial sense for fencing masters to prioritize the depiction of pole axes in their work over other staff weapons. Um, other less chivalric weapons could be ignored or glossed over due to a similar approach to their use in a martial context. Um, more specifically, it is very likely that other staff weapons were ignored because of their similar, because of their similar technical features, um, or at least because aspects of their use were covered by the multiple roles of weapons, such as the axe or the halberd. Um, however, staff weapons can be compared not just to each other, but also other weapon types. Indeed, one can see a practically ubiqui a ubiquitous trend through early fight books, which indicates that staff weapons ought to be used in a similar manner to a sword. Uh, 
This pattern exists even taking into account the multiple addresses and communication strategies of these heterogeneous, of these heterogeneous texts and whether or not they depict armoured or unarmoured combat. Um, a late 14th century text in the German National Museum in Nuremberg, uh, Codex 3227a, as uh, Eric was describing earlier, contains just a single folio pertaining as to how to fight with a staff. Um, it just labels the weapon a Stangen. It's not clear if it's, it's, it's probably a quarter staff, but it can also apply to wider staff weapons. Um, the anonymous author indicates that the art of fighting with the staff is taken from the sword, and that however one fights with the sword, that one should also fight with the staff. Um, combat using the staff also adheres to the similar principles, the before and after, and courage, quickness, cunning, and prudence are all required. The same notion can be seen in the later works of Fior de Liberi in the early 15th century. Um, by focusing on his most complete manuscripts, uh, the Yeti, um, in his section on the use of the pole axe and armor, uh, Fiore de de depicts uh, six positions and eight techniques. Um, dun -dun. Um, each of these starting positions can be seen earlier on in the manuscript. So, for example, here we have Posta Breve la Serpentina, uh, Posta de Veracroce, and the Porta di Ferro Mezzana. Um, their equivalents can all be found, with, albeit with some minor differences, earlier on in the manuscript. Um, the remaining uh, three posta can also be found in his unarmored section on Polax. Um, the techniques also are treated in a similar manner. Um, you can see here uh, similar ways of uh, dealing with an opponent's visor by thrusting into it. Um, although it should also be mentioned that uh, Fury is aware of different ways in which staff weapons can be used given their length. So for example, here he's trying to use it as a lever to sort of, um, which you, you, you couldn't necessarily do as easily with, with a shorter sword. Um, um, nevertheless, despite the occasional difference, they are overarchingly very similar. Um, such notions are further reinforced due to the fact that the Jetty manuscript also includes multiple instances of weapons which Fiore says pass for a sword and an axe, labelled as a spada atza, um, further implying a common use into how these arms are used. Um, this theme of a common approach to fighting is also employed in Le Jus de la Hache. Um, the author exhorts the reader that, I think I have it here, nope, sorry. Um, the, the author exhorts the reader that, the, the, and because of this, let every man, noble of body and courage, naturally desire to exercise and enable himself, enable himself in a virtuous and honorable occupation, and principally in a noble feat of arms, that is to say an act play, from which proceed and depend several weapons above named. Uh, the aforesaid weapons that the anonymous writer uses includes uh, the axe, the half pike, the dagger, the great sword, and the short sword. However, it is interesting to note that despite their superficial similarities about how these weapons are employed, um, Fiore and Le Jeu de la Hache actually have a significant difference as to how they approach staff weapons. Um, whilst Le Jeu de la Hache advocates that it is from axe play which other martial systems can be taught. The extended treatment of the longsword in Fiori would actually imply that he believes that the reverse is true and one can learn how to use staff weapons from being able to use a sword. Um, the brief treatment of staff weapons in Codex 3227a um, would imply a similar approach. Um, it is perhaps unusual that even though staff weapons predate the longsword, several writers advocate that the use of staff weapons is derived from them. Um, again, this is likely due to the chivalric symbolism inherent in swords and long swords, which is not present in the same level in staff weapons. Although it is not uncommon to see chivalric icons, um, such as the nine worthies depicted with them, a treatment of staff weapons in a chivalric context is beyond the confines of this paper and will have to be discussed at a later date. Um, either way, even though staff weapons predate long swords, it is easy to understand why authors such as Vardy, Vardy who advocate that the sword is a cross and a royal weapon, give this uh, theoretical hierarchy to swords. This can further be linked to earlier statements regarding the dominance of Polacks in fight books amongst staff weapons. As readers have an interest in acquiring or claiming ownership of, a no of an ennobling martial skill, so fight books fulfill that role by presenting a weapon loaded with symbolism as key to the art. Another Italian writer who, who again only briefly discusses staff weapons is the aforementioned Filippo Vardi. 
But seeking to use his work to establish patterns in the use of staff weapons in the late 15th century is a problematic approach. Um, in several places, uh, Vardy's work is little more than a rewrite of another manuscript by Fiore Daly Berry. Although Ken Monshine has noted several differences between their approach to swordplay, when it comes to the various positions and techniques, four of which are presented um, in, in his manuscript, um, uh, a few differences are discernible. Um, these which do exist are minor. Um, Fiore indicates, <laughs> Vardy, sorry, indicates slightly different positions for certain guards, um, although similarities can be seen in this and in another version of the Getty. Um, three of the four techniques are also identical. Um, there's only one from the Florius version of Fiore that Vardy has not included, um, and he replaces this with another grappling technique, which we haven't included here. Um, but again, uh, not every 15th century fight book discusses this theme of how staff weapons ought to be used in a similar manner to the sword. Um, but patterns can still be ascertained. In a quantitative comparison of Lejeune de la Hache and works by Hans Talhofer, it becomes apparent that both authors strongly rely on using the thrusting elements of the weapon. Um, this is the most common attack either prescribed or depicted in Lejeune de la Hache and in the 1459 fight book of Hans Talhofer. Indeed, the percussive aspect is rarely used, whether in Le Joux or in the 1459 or even the 1467 version of Talhofer. Um, at this point, I feel I should point out, um, because of a formatting problem with PowerPoint, uh, these colors don't necessarily correspond, and it's more important to look at the key. So what's light blue here might not be light blue down there. So, so thank you for bearing with us on that. Um, indeed, the percussive aspect is rarely used. Um, whether in Le Joux, the 1459 or the 1467. Um, one can also comment on Talhofer's proclivity uh, to ignore both percussive and, thrust, and thrusting elements of his axe and instead rely on using it to hook, throw, and unbalance an opponent. Indeed, in his 1467 fight book, nearly three quarters of the, illust of the illustrations show a disarm, a hook, or a throw. Um, unfortunately, this methodolog methodological approach is not without problems either. Um, a large number of techniques uh, does not, necessary, um, not necessarily imply a favoured or superior strategy. Um, rather, perhaps, a, wider, a wider range of possibilities in how that part of the weapon can be used. Indeed, this raises further questions about the intended use of fight books, um, but such a wide question is not the focus of this paper. Nevertheless, the diversity of techniques between sources such as Le Dieu de la Hache and Talhofer is indicative of the martial context with which the authors of fight books were concerned. Le Dieu de la Hache is addressed to a champion and has a high proportion of thrusts directed to the face, um, indicative of intent to wound, and of a more serious martial context, but also offers several ways of ending the combat non-lethally. Um, nearly half of the endings of various techniques end with the opponent either disarmed or thrown. Um, it is thus worth noting that um, ah, it is worth noting that Jacquet has recently proposed a similar idea, arguing for a playful interpretation of the anonymo bolognese. A throw or disarm could, of course, signal the, could signal the end of the combat um, or lead to further fighting. Uh, Talhofer shows several instances in which combatants have been thrown or been disarmed or discarded their weapons and resorted to grappling and using daggers to end the fight. Um, a not too dissimilar end is shown by Paulus Cal. Um, it could also be argued, however, that the heightened violence is a commercial factor, which is used to pique the interest of the reader, both in the context of the fight book genre and in 15th and 16th century art. And thus the violence displayed is not indicative of martial context. Fight books in the first half of the 16th century are far more varied in their treatment of staff weapons, as seen in our earlier table. Um, however, it is not just the variety of arms which increases, but also the depth of their treatment. The majority of 15th century fight books, with the exception of Hans Talhofer and Le Jeux de la Hache, devotes just a few folios to staff weapons. So, for example, in Paulus Cal's uh, CGM 1507, um, there are just, uh, it ranges from 32 verso to 42 verso. Um, this treatment has led Anglo to argue that several masters include staff weapons more from completeness's sake than from any genuine conviction. Um, in the case of uh, Paulus Cal and other masters such as Peter Faulkner, it is difficult to disagree. 
Arguably, their inclusion is representative of the drone popularity of staff weapons in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Yet this drone popularity was soon embraced by later practitioners. By comparison, Paulus Hector Mayer's treatment of this subject matter is far more comprehensive on a quantitative level and is far lengthier than any 15th century fight book. This is, of course, a pattern which can be expanded to the genre as a whole throughout the 15th century. Similar notions of comparative techniques also persisted. One of the reasons Morozzo gives for his limited treatments of the halberd and the axe in Opera Nova is a belief that these weapons are used in the same way. Um, regardless, of this, regardless of this approach, Morozzo still dedicated a significant amount of space within his works to the explanation of staff weapons, to, to an explanation of staff weapon techniques with a variety of weapons. Um, so, to conclude, the chronological frame and popularity of staff weapons in fight books corresponds to their increasing popularity in their historic context of 15th and 16th century, the 15th and 16th century. A quick investigation, such as of the sources mentioned earlier, shows an increasing frequency in appearance after the middle and particularly after the third quarter of the 15th century. Progressively, there's not only an increase in space dedicated to staff weapons, but from roughly the beginning of the 16th century, there's also an increasing variety represented in the genre. Whereas the sword remains the undisputed champion of weapons, regardless, regardless the different forms encountered in the 15th and 16th century, uh, because of its popularity and role as a symbol and use arguably as the default weapon of preference by nobles, civilians and soldiers, staff weapons gains their popularity because of their increasing and extensive use during this period in warfare. The role of infantry and the conduct of war with the coordinated use of arms is one of the characteristics of European battlefields during this period, from small scale to larger conflicts such as the Swiss Burgundian Wars, the Italian Wars, and even the German Peasant Revolts. Therefore, it can be argued that the increasing inclusion and projection of staff weapons in written sources, art, and of course fight books writ within the discussed period is an expression of the changes and trends of the European martial culture. The sword represents a constant factor in the martial traditions of the time, but it is the staff weapon that better illustrates the military changes and status of the countries where fight books flourished as a genre. Today, because of time limitations, we've only scraped the surface of potential. We've only scraped the surface of the potential of staff weapon studies and their place in fight books. Our hope is that in the future, further research will proceed with a further analysis of different aspects of the topic, such as source comparison as well as a qualitative and quantitative study of available sources. Uh, thank you. I'd now like to invite Yarsen to receive any questions you may have instead of me. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Great questions, but you just made exactly the point that we're trying to make about staff weapons being understudied and how much there is to say about them and about the percentage of papers addressing swords and not staff weapons. Um, when it comes to armed and unarmed combat, I actually think that there's significant differences to when um, the writers address uh, the equivalent uh, while using swords. This changes from the 15th to the 16th century. In the 15th century, I think that all techniques are intended to be used either way, but especially in armored combat. Even though the 
of, often they're displayed uh, unarmored. I think that the, the civic use of that, of, of them techniques, changes significantly uh, once you get printed sources in the 16th century. Uh, and once you go to uh, Meir and, uh, uh, or even uh, Marozzo, um, you can observe that, that specific things are meant to be used while in armor, unarmored, or lightly armored. Um, then when it comes to the question about uh, Faulkner about the axe and the halberd, great, well, that's a great question as well about terminology. I think the problem with the axe, that's why we had the definition in the beginning, uh, about this one. Uh, as you know, my, my biggest fetish is terminology of staff weapons, but uh, I think that the halberd, the axe, the axe, the atza, and all these terms are meant to uh, demonstrate, well, to, to represent a weapon, describe a weapon that has three offensive features, regardless of the, what they might be. Um, so there are cases where I think um, where you have a mention even of the Mordax, which can, is a hybrid, I would say, of between, something between a halberd and a polax. And I think uh, that, that poster over there addresses the same thing very nicely. Um, and it, it, it's the basic problem of terminology of uh, how them, these people um, saw weapons and how, how they called them and how we call them. And of course, there's no cohesion between them too because we use something completely artificial. Um, I think when it comes to the terminology of the axe of, or any axe, any halberd, we need to judge uh, on a fight book to fight book um, analysis. And what was the last part? <laughs> the oh, the, the, long, the long stuff, yeah. Um, I, I found two different trends when it come, comes to uh, long stuff, and we discussed that with Jacob. There's, pe there's fight books that address it as a separate weapon, so you, you see a limited uh, amount of techniques. And then I don't remember now from the top of my head who, uh, there's two or three fight books that pretty much say, do this with a, fight, uh, with, with a staff and then apply this to everything else. Um, the problem is that um, a staff, and that's something that, that's all the way I, I exclude it completely from my own research, doesn't have an offensive metal feature. Um, you can probably, you can most likely kill somebody with a staff, you can perform all the techniques, but at the same time you're limited as to what you can perform. So you can do the basic hit strikes with both ends as well, as well and you can even hit with the middle, uh, but you cannot pull, you cannot uh, push effectively, I think. Uh, I hope that answers a, uh, a bit of it, but as, as I said, look, four, four, no, four questions is exactly why we did this. Oh, this one. Um, Am I correct that it's in your blood? Yeah, yeah. Can you actually go through a breastplate? Is it, is it? Most certainly. Uh, I think uh, from the third quarter of the 15th century, most staff weapons develop in a way the, the vertical feature uh, where they reinforce spikes specifically to penetrate armor or at least do the maximum damage. In this case, I think it's a bit exaggerated because that's the whole point of this specific uh, work to, um, to show it as violent, as bloody as possible for commercial purposes, in my opinion, and in Eric's opinion, as he said earlier. Um, because uh, as we saw from this and as we saw from uh, Matthias's paper earlier, sex and violence sells. So I think it is possible, maybe not on that spot on the, on the breastplate, maybe with a different technique, but from, from a physics uh, uh, and mechanics perspective, it's something that can be done quite easily. Uh, I did not expect it, but that's what experiments actually show. No, because it's, it's quite interesting. <coughs> if it goes through the time, you see that the best plate is actually uh, developing. So it's a single one, a double one. It can be quality on the iron, and it's an iron, it's off it. And it's just the pistol shots they do, and so what can go through? Um, so 
I, I think even against good breastplates, even against good steel, uh, you get examples of halberds and pole axes, but especially halberds, that um, they, they, they change completely the, the vertical spike to become triangular or quadrangular, precisely to penetrate armor. Because initially it starts from the point where it's, uh, it's an extension of the blade and so it has um, a diamond shaped cross section and that becomes narrower and narrower precisely to penetrate. It's more, 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 more. Exactly. Sorry? Like um, I'm, not, I'm not very, very familiar with crossbow balls, but yeah. I only know of two, uh, and they're not very good, but we cannot be certain if they've been penetrated by swords or halberds, unless we run theoretical, uh, sorry, not, unless we run practical experiments. Uh, we cannot do that, but unfortunately, or fortunately, museums will not let us do that. I agree. I, 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 have not, I have not looked at that at all. I don't know if, if Jacob has looked into that. Oh. But it's uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, that, that, that.
Oh, yeah. I, 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 So, it, it, uh, no, I, I, uh, I, okay. I, I, I know where the extension is. No, but uh, both of the depictions uh, of Mission Combat, the two you can see, are usually bloody. They, they end with the section. Um, sure, I would totally agree, but the thing is, um, how many uh, descriptions of actual combats in this situation do we have? That end up bloody, that they end up with killing the opponent. Yeah. We don't have many evidence that this actually happened. We have some, I agree, but it's in, in the sources. Outside of the fight books, the practice is not very dominant. So it's more or less like uh, the, the judicial combat is actually disappearing in the 15th century. So there are some cases, but not many. And if this was everyday practice, um, there would have been more, more traces. If you, if, you, if you allow me to say something, and I'll show you again why staff weapons are important. <laughs> uh, Le jeu, which is not illustrated at all, is also written in a fashion to demonstrate, to, to describe how to fight in hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat with the axe, but also in the context of judicial combat. And it mentions that explicitly. But, in my opinion, sure, they're exaggerated and the addition of the, the premise for judicial combat is an extra commercial element uh, for a specific reason. When you try to sell this as, as an object, as a skill to a customer, how many times your customer is going to fight in a judicial duel? You probably maybe once, and you might die. Oh. So it's not, a repet it's, not, it's not a skill that you get for repetition. It's something that you get... Um, to show, look, I, as, as one of you said, this is the worst case scenario that I can train you for. You can learn from, from me something to, to fight with your friends and spar, or, or, or show off and say, look, if, if I go into this scenario, I will prevail. and shields and uh, the source the unarmed, unarmed and they, the source mentions that afterwards th this was quite a dishonorable thing because actually the, the guy killed the other guy and even in judicial combat it is not meant to you don't have to kill the other guy you can kill him it's okay but you don't have to to prove your point you can just um, well win yeah? after it's, it's a it's a non-fighting situation <coughs> after all but it's violent definitely and uh, the, the source described that afterwards um, the honor of the city was restored because uh, after it was two noblemen fought in armor with axes and no one got hurt. Yeah. So they settled the dispute. Uh, it was a mean to prove your point at a court, a uh, judicial court. And so this proved that maybe it was not that bloody in practice as it was described in these, in these sources. Matthias? 
say something as well. What we're discussing now, I think this is very important uh, in general for the topic that we're discussing here, the fact books. We cannot talk about the fact books without contextualizing them with the historical evidence that we have otherwise, because otherwise if you only look at the fact books, for example, we have this here very clearly, if you only look at the fact books, then you think, okay, fighting with the Polex looked like this. Yeah, but I think what Eric says is true, and there's no matter about which area we're talking about, no matter we're talking about Japan, about modern day Israel or whatever, you need to have to, to be aware of, aware of the surroundings. Yeah, otherwise, we are living in uh, at least a completely wrong, wrong way. Right? Okay, I thank both of you, Jacob and Jason, for your paper. Thank you very much. Thank you.